Okay, thank you, Lauren. This is a presentation by the Lee County Board Association, the ADR practice section. Um, thank you, Lauren Bob, for uh, setting up the Zoom and, and helping with all the stuff you do so well. Uh, my name is Ann Dalton, and um, we are here today to discuss the following. Has the time come to arbitrate equitable distribution issues in family law? I'll tell you right off the bat, my answer is yes. Um, maybe that's a spoiler, so don't hang up. So I want to introduce my uh, my co-presenters today. We're very, very lucky to have the Honorable Carolyn Swift join us today presenting. And Judge Swift has been a member of the Florida Bar since 1999, and she has become board certified in marital and family law in 2007. She was elected to the circuit court bench in 2018. She currently presides over the unified family court docket in Lee County. She was previously appointed as a magistrate in Lee County in July 2012, and during her years of private practice, she was a partner at Insignaris and Swift PA, and prior to that was a partner at Henderson, Franklin, Starnes, and Holt PA. I can tell you that I was lucky enough to mediate her relatively early in her lawyer career, and she was a fantastic person to mediate with. Alexandra Kleinfeld is our second presenter, and she's the founder of Kleinfeld Law Firm, PLLC, a Lee County law firm focusing on the state trust probate family corporate and immigration law. In addition to her litigation and transactional practice, attorney Kleinfeld is an alternative dispute resolution professional. She holds a Florida Supreme Court certification in family and county mediation, a Florida Supreme Court qualification in arbitration. She's trained in elder mediation and provides conflict resolution and problem solving services. She's a member of the Lee County Bar Association, the Florida Bar and the ABA. She's a frequent presenter on topics of interest to Florida litigators and ADR professionals. My name is Ann Dalton. I'm here as the chair of this section and in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip all of my credentials because they're not that fancy anyway. So I'm gonna turn it over to Alexandra to, uh, to use our slide person today. Well, thank you so much, Anne, and um, a special thank you to Judge Swift to join us today. Um, we really honor your appearance. So, and as uh, Anne already mentioned, uh, we will talk a lot about probably a little controversy topic in regard to arbitration of equitable distribution in family law cases. So um, in order to get an overview of what we are actually trying to do here today, we should probably start with the definition and explanation of some of the terms. So the first part of course is definition of mediation. And I looked up the Black's Law Dictionary definition of mediation, which is a method of non-binding dispute resolution involving a neutral third party who tries to help the disputing parties reach a mutually agreeable solution. Well, that's a great definition. However, if we would start our mediation sessions um, with this definition um, for our parties, I don't think they would know what's really going on. So we as mediators actually try to help them understand what they should expect and can expect from a mediation. And um, so the, the most important thing for them to understand is really that mediation is their platform, it's their session to be able to communicate with each other and hopefully resolve the underlying issues of the case. We as mediators are only there as neutral, impartial third persons, and we facilitate the communication. We will outline the issues and we will help them to see, okay, so um, husband is looking for this, wife is looking for that. Is there any chance of actually combining their wishes and come to an agreement? Um, also, it's very important that the parties understand that mediation is a confidential process. And we always have to remind them, you have to be by yourself in the room. And sometimes we even have to ask them if they could just um, show with a camera the room if we have the feeling somebody else is in the room and we have to ask them to leave. Also, they need to understand because it's confidential, they cannot discuss anything that's being said in mediation with anybody outside of the setting. Yes, of course, they can talk to the attorney after the mediation. However, it's important for them to understand that 
they cannot just um, say or mention anything in a hearing in front of a judge of what they have learned in mediation. Um, I know some parties may try that. So we try as the mediators to make them understand you cannot do that. Um, also, it's, it's very important to point out that the process itself of mediation is voluntarily. They have been normally ordered to attend mediation by the court. So for them, it's, oh, I have to do this. I must do this. So for us, it's important to point out the process is voluntarily, even though they have been ordered to attend. And I think that also takes a lot of relief from the parties because everything involving the court, I think it's a scary thing for any party, even if they are represented by an attorney, it's always scary if the court is involved. So to, to take this um, being afraid of a court case from those parties, I think they, the interactions will also be a little bit more informal and freely and they see that there's not that much pressure as they thought it would be because it's really on their terms. Um, we as the mediator, we will not judge anything. We will listen to everything and relate to the other party. However, they really can talk freely and can discuss everything in detail. Um, so in, in addition, it's also important um, to see that there will be emotions evolved in a mediation. And we as the mediator, I think we, we have more um, leeway to take care of those emotions. For judges, I think it's sometimes difficult and please Judge Swift, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you cannot take care of the emotions of the parties. You, you have to take the law into consideration. And for us as the mediator, we can let them talk if they need to talk and also listen to, okay, so what's maybe in between the lines to better help them. Um, and I think for you, it's a little bit difficult to do that. So I don't know, Judge Swift, what do you um, think about that? Well, sure. I mean, the mediation has a lot more time for probably some therapeutic emotional venting than a lot of times we have in our courtroom. Although sometimes we do give them an opportunity to say what they really need to say so they can move on in court, but with our fullness of our dockets. Further, the mediation and their resolution and their self-determination has a lot more options on how they heal from that than in the court where we are stuck with the strict constructs of the law. Thank you. And um, so now it's time to get a little bit to know the definition of non-binding and binding arbitration. And I would like to actually get Anne involved. Thank you. Um, so um, there's, I, I would like to first have a general introduction about what arbitration is. And arbitration is defined, <clears throat> excuse me, under Florida Statute 441011 as a process whereby a neutral third person or panel called an arbitrator considers the facts and arguments presented by the parties and renders a decision which may be binding or non-binding. So basically the arbitrator is, uh, is in the nature of a, a private judge. There is a distinction between um, binding and non-binding arbitration. Um, but I wanna draw your attention before I get into that specific definition to uh, Florida Statute 61.052 subparagraph five. Um, and the arbitration, um, arbitration information with regard to family law is a little bit all over the map, and this is an illustration of that. This statute says the court may enforce an antinuptial agreement to arbitrate a dispute in accordance with the law and tradition chosen by the parties. I think that's fascinating, the tradition. How often does the law incorporate uh, the tradition by specific reference? Anyway, moving on to the definition of the non-binding arbitration, and that's found in Florida Statute 44.103. Uh, non-binding arbitration um, under the statute is only court-ordered non-binding arbitration. So that's my first point. There, uh, parties have the ability to have non-binding arbitration that is not ordered by the court. But what I'm gonna be discussing is just the court-ordered arbitration because we can't talk about everything today. Um, so the question is, um, um, how does this process work? So 
the parties pick an arbitrator or several arbitrators or the judge does and um, the arbitration is scheduled and um, it's held it's a quasi-judicial, so what is heard by uh, the judge is something that is presented to both parties. You can't, you can't address the judge on a confidential basis, unlike mediation. And then um, after the arbitrator hears the case, the decision is made. That decision under traditional non-binding arbitration is filed with the court under seal. And then uh, there's an opportunity if one party doesn't like what happened in the arbitration to file for a de novo. It's not an appeal, it's a de novo. And that de novo must be, must be filed within 20 days. If it's not filed between, uh, within 20 days, then the decision stands and there's some other ramifications of that. So that's non-binding arbitration. And I'm emphasizing that that is a process whereby there is an out quote unquote, for the parties if they don't like what the arbitrator did. Binding arbitration, it, it follows the same general path. The parties or the council uh, select a arbitrator um, and the decision is made by the arbitrator in a, in a crazy judicial capacity. Um, and um, I like this definition of binding arbitration. It substitutes a tribunal of the party's own choosing for the one provided and established by law. The enforcement of a binding arbitration is much different. The enforcement is through filing of a petition for a final judgment. So binding arbitration is actually conducted outside the court process. It's not part of the court process until an action for enforcement is commenced. The non-binding arbitration is within the context of, of the court process. And then on a binding arbitration, the, there are various uh, grounds for appeal, but they're very, very narrow. Uh, basically, did the arbitrator mess up? Did they not comply with the proper rules? Uh, was there prejudice? Um, or whether the decision was contrary to the Florida Constitution, it doesn't say Florida law, it says Florida Constitution or the United States Constitution. It's not a de, de novo. So non-binding is it de novo, you get back in the court, you have your day in court in front of the magistrate or the judge. Binding arbitration, unless the arbitrator really makes a terrible mistake, um, it's, there's not really much of an appeal there. Um, now the court um, statute, I'm sorry, the statute says 44.104 sub paragraph 12, binding arbitration does not apply to disputes involving child custody, visitation or child support or disputes involving the rights of third parties, not a party to the arbitration. So we'll see a little bit later and I wanna be very clear here. We're talking about binding arbitration only. So we'll see a little bit later where the courts have interpreted that language. Um, that language does not apply to non-binding arbitration under the statute, but I would submit that the safer ground for all of us if we want to commence this process is to have the non-binding arbitrations strictly for equitable distribution in non-child cases. So um, I'm going to turn it back to, um, to Alexandra, unless Judge Swift, did you have a comment at this point? No. Okay. Back to Alexandra. Well, thank you very much, Anne. And um, so we want to also see what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of the processes involved. And in mediation, I mean, one of the advantages um, that we can really point out is, of course, the costs. So if the parties decide to go to mediation, unless it's court ordered, of course, but still um, the costs will tremendously be reduced if they can reach a settlement during mediation. Um, so if for whatever reason, they decided to go to court, get a divorce, it's mandatory that they have to go to mediation first before um, going through the avenue of seeing the judge who will make a decision on their behalf. So if the parties are able um, to resolve any underlying issues about their case, then they can stop basically right there. Yes, they still need a final judgment. However, the entire proceeding does not, not have to move forward um, with the court and in front of a judge. Um, so they will save attorney's fees. 
and maybe any additional court costs depending on whatever they are trying to um, actually resolve. So that's one of the huge advantages in mediation. Then we do have the ability of the parties to address the distribution of their personal property in detail, which in court, um, it's probably not that easy to really lay out um, to the judge, well, um, but I want this dresser because it means so much to me. My parents bought it for us and um, I don't know, it was a wedding gift from my parents, so that's why I want this dresser. Um, there's just not enough time if uh, you see a judge, but in mediation, you can take the time and actually point out to the other party why you really want this certain item. And maybe the other party then will understand uh, you explaining why you want this and maybe has a change of heart and not fight about this specific item. And um, so that's one good thing that you can actually attack your problem and not each other in the mediation setting. Hopefully, I know sometimes they do it to, uh, attack each other. However, it's, it's still, it's, it's a platform and the session that you can talk things out and make the other person, the other party see and understand how you feel and why you want to pursue a certain thing. So, and um, it's also a good thing that you, or the parties, you help them, of course, that the parties have the ability to make the decision about the distribution themselves. Um, I mean, the judge maybe will listen to some of the points they have to say. Uh, however, in the end, the judge will decide who gets the dresser. Um, but in mediation, again, you can contribute to the decision-making process. You will work on the uh, your decision-making and the parties can make informed decisions based on the understanding of each other. Also a huge advantage in my eyes is that it's the voluntary and informal act of the mediation. I already talked about the voluntary part. Yes, if it's court ordered, they have to attend. However, I always try to explain to them if at any point you feel we are not getting anywhere, if you feel it's too far apart, we can stop, we can declare an impasse. So it takes a lot of the pressure from the parties um, to, to think I have to come to an agreement today. Well, yes, it's beneficial if they come to an agreement. However, it's still not a must for them. And the informal setting, I think it's very convenient right now with the virtual mediations that we are able to offer that the parties can be in their own environment. They feel comfortable. They are at home. Maybe they are at work. Sometimes I know they're in their car because there's just no other place for them to be by themselves. However, it's their environment. And you don't take them out of this comfortable setting and put them into a room. If we are in the mediation office, yes, we do have the conference rooms. However, it's still a different environment. Um, so it's also informal. It's, it's better probably for them than sitting in a courtroom. Um, however, really having them in their own environment helps, I believe, at least the entire mediation setting. And then we um, also, um, of course, that's, that goes with the costs that we um, can avoid prolonged court proceedings. So if they agree to everything in mediation, perfect. The, the case will stop with the final judgment, the judge actually adopting the settlement agreement and they are done. So it takes a lot of the emotional stress away. It also takes away the financial burden and um, they can hopefully move on with a better relationship than they are left with fighting over everything in court. It, it just helps the entire relationship of um, the family, I believe, if they are able to settle in mediation and agree on their own terms to distribute everything. Of course, we also have disadvantages in mediation. And um, I think one big fact to point out is the cooperation, cooperation of the parties. And this is a fact that um, 
even though they always tell us, well, I did say everything, well, they never tell you everything. Um, it's, it's just, they, they will keep things away from you as the mediator and for sure also from the attorney. So you can only go by um, what they tell you. And sometimes um, the parties haven't even done the discovery right now. Yes, they actually have to have discovery done um, before they can go to mediation. However, that still doesn't mean that they did provide all the information that should be available to make decisions. Um, and also the, the parties have to be open-minded and willing to compromise when they are in a mediation setting. So if I go in with a mindset of, I don't care what she has to say or he has to say, I just want this. And if he or she doesn't abide by that, I don't care. So they do have to really be willing and open for this entire process. They have to be honest to each other about the finances to come to a fair settlement to both parties. And um, mediation is certainly not the place to conduct further um, discovery or to come up with any other kind of discovery. So it's, it's really important that the parties do understand that. Also, um, in mediation, one party might try to intimidate the other party to come to an agreement. Of course, this is the part where the mediator comes in and um, is able to intervene if uh, he or she thinks the, the party uh, cannot act on any self-determination, is threatened or intimidated. So you can take them aside and you can even stop and terminate the uh, mediation if you think, well, it, it's really not beneficial for this party because he or she is so afraid of the other party and there's just no way that they come to a fair settlement. Um, then the ability to address distribution of personal property can also be a disadvantage. Um, they can start fighting and get off track about certain things. So this is a huge disadvantage and you're not getting anywhere. So as the mediator, you have to step in and say, okay, so I do understand that um, this is a huge issue for you. However, in order to maybe take the most out of the mediation, um, we can revisit this and we should continue with something else in the meantime and see if we are able to actually come to an agreement on these other issues you have. So it's, it's very um, important for the mediator to see the balance and to see the dynamic of the mediation between the parties um, if there are no attorneys involved, to get them back on track to have a meaningful mediation process. Um, of course, there's always the chance, and even if you have attorneys, one party could still hide assets, um, which will be maybe discovered during mediation or which will not be, be discovered during mediation. And this um, leaves a huge disadvantage for the other party. So, um, it's, it's really advantage and disadvantage in one, yeah, for one sake, but um, I think it's, it's more of an advantage for the people to talk about everything and also get their emotions out. I think that's, that's the most important process in mediation to have the parties deal with their emotions on their terms and help, help them to come to a solution of everything. And I don't know, um, Judge Swift, I, and again, I, I saw you nodding at times and um, in agreement that, uh, yes, it can be good for parties to actually discuss everything in detail, uh, like every minor, I don't know, if they have collectibles, but for you as a judge, I don't know if you would really look at every item in detail or if you just say, okay, so we have 100 collectibles and each of them gets 50 collectibles. So fortunately, as a judge, I haven't really had to do that. Although as a magistrate, I spent afternoons going about what was in the storage unit. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, I think I hand it in credit to attorneys and to mediators. I, I think back to when I was a younger attorney and I was even dating my husband and he didn't understand why mediation took 10 hours because, you know, you, we got the whole deal done. And then on the ninth hour, we're fighting about glasses from Target. So 
I mean, you know, whatever you all can do to move that to the end issue, but then sometimes that's the deal breaker because that's the last emotional issue. But obviously in court, we don't spend the time that you sometimes have to spend usually on the glasses from Target. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think sometimes, um, you know, we might send parties to mediation to figure out, okay, you each get 50 collectibles, go with a mediator and you do one for, choice A for the husband, choice B for the wife and on and on and on. But um, obviously, you know, the mediators settle a lot of cases and I guess I, I rather get more into the arbitration because I think that's really the more exciting part of why we're here. Right. And I actually hand over to Anne for the next part. Awesome. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, as you might have picked up already, I, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of non-binding arbitration and equitable distribution. Um, um, let me explain a little bit why. Um, the parties get to select the arbitrator, um, and in non-binding arbitration, the judge can actually appoint an arbitrator if the parties do not have one. Um, up here in Lee County, I know we have some of our folks from Collier joining us, and thank you for that. Um, up here in Lee County, we have a structure in place in the civil cases where uh, the judge orders the parties to non-binding arbitration. They have X period of time to select their own arbitrator. If they don't do so, one is assigned by the court. Um, the advantage to non-binding arbitration is scheduling flexibility. Um, you can, if, if you go private, if you do a private arbitrator, you can select an arbitrator who's best suited for the issues that you have confronting you. Um, I think for equitable distribution, um, I think the practitioners um, on this call and the judges on this call who have been um, doing this for a while, uh, and not to mention several magistrates whose names will go anonymously, um, probably tear their hair out about, oh my goodness, um, I had a mediation where the parties went to, they were married for a very long time and they went to yard sales every weekend and they both came in with these thick uh, single space uh, spiral bound notebooks of all the, forgive the expression, junk they wanted to split up. And that would be an ideal circumstance where, uh, where an arbitrator could uh, plow through it and say, you get this, you get that. In this particular mediation, we had it about half done. And then one of them said, oh, wait a minute, I wanna go back to the elephant trunk that we talked about in hour number one. Maybe I do want that. Um, and um, I'm sure we've all experienced frustration, maybe not to that extreme level, but frustration in ED cases where you know what, what, the, what it should be. And, um, and some of these cases, uh, these, as Alexandra said, some of these cases, people take the trunk from grandma uh, to heart and just will not let go of it. And so those kinds of cases, I think, were, are perfectly appropriate for non-binding arbitration. As I mentioned, there's a, there is a, a, a process in the civil side uh, for appointing a non-binding arbitrator and uh, it would be easily converted to the family side or counsel can choose to do the uh, non-binding arbitration without a court order. Um, some of the advantages are it takes the burden from the, um, from the judiciary. There's a neutral third party evaluator who doesn't have a, uh, you know, an interest in the outcome. Um, it's possible to spend, the, the arbitrator deals with the issues that he or, she is, he or she is presented. What that means is that the parties and counsel can come in with two things that they just can't get past, or they can come in, God help us all, with a hundred things they can't get past. Um, and, um, and I think it's a very safe process from a pretty malpractice standpoint, to be totally candid because there's always an ability to have a trial de novo. You can have the judge take a, a look at what the arbitrator did um, under certain circumstances. Now, I don't wanna get bogged down in the, in, the, um, in the weeds right now and how all that process works. It's very clearly laid out in the statute, but um, I, uh, I really think that, uh, I, don't, I really don't think there's a downside to it. It's not appropriate for every case, obviously, um, but, um, it's, uh, I think it's appropriate for a lot of our cases and takes a lot of the burden away from the judiciary and from our magistrates and puts it where it belongs. I mean, as a mediator, um, I, I'm probably known as a fairly aggressive mediator, uh, but 
I'm, I'm constrained by the boundaries of the mediation to not make decisions. I can make suggestions, but not decisions. So those are uh, some of the advantages. Um, so some of the disadvantages would be um, the cost. I mean, there's a cost of presenting it was basically uh, in the nature of a mini trial. Um, the other thing is the parties may not buy into the process. You may have a client who's gung-ho until they actually get in there and then they get cold feet and say, well, wait a minute, why, why am I in front of this person? Why, why, I wanna go see the judge. And so if the parties don't buy into the process, that's gonna be a problem. And then of course, if one side doesn't like the outcome, there is the trial de novo. So that's kind of a double-edged sword. So uh, I, I wanna move on from that because I, I definitely wanna get in some, into some uh, discussion. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna head right into, oh, I'm sorry, Judge Swift, did you have something you wanted to say? I apologize. Okay, I keep, I keep not doing that and I apologize. Um, so I wanna get right into binding arbitration. It is a totally different kind of an animal in, in how it resolves itself. But, the, but the, uh, some of, it does mimic some of the same qualities as the uh, binding or non-binding arbitration. Um, in binding arbitration, it is not a court process. The judge, in my opinion, cannot order the parties to go to binding arbitration. It's a process outside the court process. There are a couple of cases that, that I'd like to talk about. Um, as I mentioned early on, um, there is a statute that says binding arbitration does not apply to what I'm gonna call kid issues or disputes involving the rights of third parties who are not a party to the litigation. Um, so that, that, that part of the statute does not apply to non-binding arbitration but I think as a practical matter, I don't think we want arbitrators deciding kid stuff, but, um, but I wanna stress that uh, binding arbitration cannot involve what I'm calling the kid issues. There are a couple of cases on point with binding arbitration. Um, one of them, the kind of the seminal case is um, where um, there, were, there was a combined issue regarding alimony and child support and some other issues and, um, the, um, the court said no, because child support is intertwined with, uh, with alimony decisions um, and they're interrelated. You cannot use binding arbitration where there's any alimony involved. It's, it's a third DCA case. Um, there's a follow-up case um, called Martinez versus Kurt. And um, the parties had agreed that they would go into arbitration for future disputes. Um, that was part of their, uh, their MSA before the final judgment. And judge said, nope, can't do that. Uh, when there's a minor child involved, you know, I'm not gonna let you use arbitration for any case involving children, even if it's a financial dispute between the adults that on paper does not affect the children because the court, the court said it, all that kind of stuff involved, it affects kids. Um, there's a third case, um, I quoted uh, early on a statute about antinuptial agreements where it says the court can enforce antinuptial agreements to arbitrate disputes. This case is the only case I could find that specifically addresses that statute. And that statute again is 61.052 uh, subparagraph five. That case is um, Caldwell versus Caldwell. And the court did upheld, excuse me, uphold the arbitration requirement. Um, from the facts that appeared, there were no, ch no minor child related issues. The, um, it was a fairly short case, but they just talked about ED, alimony and attorney fees. Um, so we, so I, I think that's, that's an interesting nuance, but an important nuance. And going into the advantages quickly, because as I said, we'd like to have some discussion. Um, the, the advantages uh, basically are not that much different from the non-binding. The advantages are you have a neutral third party evaluator. You take a burden from the judiciary. Once again, this is outside the judicial process. A judge cannot order binding arbitration, but, if, but parties can engage in it if they choose to. Um, there's an ability to address distribution of personal property in detail. The way you get into the, ju into the judicial process is um, once you have a binding arbitration result, uh, it's called a decision and award, then one party takes it into the court on a petition uh, to, to make it enforceable. 
um, as you might do with other things. But other than that, it's outside the judicial process. Um, disadvantage would be uh, if the arbitrator does a bad job or somebody thinks the arbitrator does a bad job, you have very limited resource, recourse. Um, the statutory ability to challenge binding arbitrations, basically if the arbitrator makes a, makes a mistake of some sort is what it boils down to. And also the cost. I mean, there's always, uh, you always as, as practitioners and as, as judges, we have to always consider uh, how much is this gonna cost parties? So that's uh, it's a little bit of a, a fine tune on, on non-binding and binding arbitration. I want to very, very quickly go through MedArb. Um, MedArb is a com combination of mediation and arbitration. Um, and um, the advantage of a MedArb, you do the mediation first. If that's not successful, you go into an arbitration status. You can use the same person to do, to do both of those, or you can do two different people to, to do uh, to do those those two components. It's uh, there's very strong feelings on both sides. The advantage of a of a uh, MedArb is uh, the duration. If the med orbs that I do, you do the mediation, and then if it's not successful, you swing immediately into the arbitration that same day. Um, and the advantage, of course, the other advantage is the mediator knows the issues because they've just mediated them. Unfortunately, simultaneously, that is the disadvantage because the mediator knows confidential Im information for the non-binding arbitration. I think there's ways to handle that, but uh, but that's, that's a little bit beyond what I'd like to talk about now. We have about 20 minutes left um, for Q&A. Um, I wanna ask first Judge Swift, I, I, I've said a lot of stuff. Did you have any thoughts about that, ma'am? Um, I just think that it's a great new tool in our toolbox that frankly, I never really thought about arbitration in family, even though I've been doing family for you know two decades by now. Um, but, you know, it's even if you go to the AAML website for the Florida chapter, there's a whole section on arbitration in family law because I was kind of broadening. So I think it's um, great. I sort of see the non -bind the binding as the most useful, basically hiring a private judge so the parties get a quicker day in court and they pick the date, they pick the place, they pick the time um, that, you know, either in cases where it's personal property or maybe cases where it's personal businesses with a lot of confidentiality issues. Um, I, I think there's lots of opportunities and I look forward to hearing about more of these cases. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, and um, I think Alexander, maybe if you could stop sharing, we can um, just sort of see everybody. Um, oh, I forgot that beautiful ending that you did. <laughs> thank and, you. But, by the way, Alexandra did put this entire uh, thing together and she gets big, big, big kudos for that. So, um, okay. So um, I, I have some uh, ringers in the crowd. So um, I'm gonna ask Linda Freed. What do you think about this, Linda? I'm not a ringer. <laughs> well, I meant, you know, that I kind of figured you would have a strong opinion. I mean, I, 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 I think it could be very exciting. I mean, I. I'm not sure exactly how it would work, but I definitely would be game to try. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. I, I don't like calling on judges because, you know, they wear those big robes and sit up high, but do any of our judges want to weigh in on this? For example, Judge Paris, I see your smiling face down there. Sorry, I needed to to unmute myself. Yeah, honestly, like Judge Swift said, it's not something I had given a lot of thought to, but I, I, it sounds very interesting, and certainly some of the advantages that you brought up um, regarding the arbitration process, especially like uh, the binding arbitration, I can see a lot of benefits to it. Uh, you know. But like Judge Swift said, again, over 20 years of practice, it's not something that I had seen really come up. Um, but these are evolving times, and it's certainly something to think about for you practitioners. Time definitely is a big factor, and litigating some of these real, these personal property issues and these property issues 
in the courtroom takes up a lot of time and something that could be done pretty efficiently and effectively in arbitration. So certainly something to think about. Thank you. Do any of our other judges want to weigh in on this or, or any of our practitioners? Um, I would say I'm, I'm excited about the possibility of it. I do think, at least from a judicial standpoint, it really kind of has to be the perfect case. It has to be the type of case that comes before us that's really only about equitable distribution issues because can't get into any of those other things. And it's got to be parties with significant assets because the cost of it is just going to be so much higher. So I've considered it before as to whether or not to order it. But as of this point, I haven't. I'm waiting for that special case, though. Great. Thank you very much, Judge Cohen. Anybody else? And I don't have anything else I can add to what the other three judges have said. They've, they've done a great job. So I concur in their position. I, I don't see this because I'm, I do the only the crossover family cases that arise out of dependency or delinquency. So I'm never going to really have a case that doesn't have children involved. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see this. So thank you for having us, though. Well, for the future, Judge, if and when you turn over to the family docket, it might be something that we take for granted, like mediation. Sure, absolutely. I, I understand. I, I appreciate the opportunity to listen in on this today. It's been helpful. Herb, do you have a thought here? Um, I always have a thought. But, uh, <laughs> but actually, uh, um, in the non-binding arbitration aspect, and I understand you're really pressing on the binding arbitration, but... But um, as non-bonding arbitration, I don't see how it really can work because uh, the the uh, the way it's enforced in the typical now non-bonding arbitration is that if it if you don't get within a certain range of what you would have gotten if you asked for a new trial, you have to pay the other side's attorney's fees. Well, in a divorce, it's a whole different aspect of how you decide who pays whose attorney's fees, and so it, it seems to be would be unfair. I think if, you know, if let's say the husband has all the, the money and the wife doesn't, but she's not happy with the arbitration decision in non-binding arbitration, and she says, I'm not going to go with it, well, then her penalty is going to be, he, she has to pay his, and it, it just doesn't make sense. I, I just don't think non-binding arbitration would work, even aside from all the children issues and the fact that, you know, in a divorce, it's all kind of interwoven in terms of various aspects. And sometimes people give up more in one direction if they get something in the other direction and it may involve children. But even that aside, you don't have the, the way to enforce it as you would in a, you know, in a, a roof leak kind of a case. That's my thought. Eve, I saw you waving your hand. Um, I think that non-binding arbitration uh, after mediation is effective where specialized knowledge uh, is needed and it's not something uh, a judge would necessarily have and you would choose your mediator arbitrator who had particular knowledge about that business or that aspect of economic activity, uh, primarily businesses. And, and the non-binding part is frequently, they give you a perspective that nobody had thought about, which can frequently lead to, well, we're not necessarily accepting that, you can make the deal. It doesn't come up that much, but I have found that it has been proven very helpful. And in the old days, back in the 80s, you'd find somebody about the same age and generation as the judge. You'd buy them coffee and you'd run it by them and they would give you a perspective, again, that you never thought of. Uh, as a younger lawyer, I would never have thought of that. And you go, oh, I need to settle this. Uh, and that also is quite another technique similar to the mediation arbitration approach. So there, there's a place for it. Unfortunately, it's not a big place. And that's why almost everybody here has rarely done this. Well, I don't think that's a good point. And I, I think that the point that several people have made is it's, it's just another tool in the toolbox, uh, appropriate sometimes and not appropriate other times. So, um, and I, I've had people in mediation turn to me and say, uh, hey, would you just make a decision? Now, that doesn't mean that they would live happily with the decision, but, um, but they seem sort of despairing when they say things like that. I think giving the mediator the option to actually give you an opinion, uh, here's what I think you might want to do, which you can't do otherwise, that frequently is helpful, again, for 
uh, on a non-binding way to go, uh, something to talk to your client, at least it'll be over. If we do it this way, here's a solution on the table. If you want to keep going, that's fine. There's dollars involved with, uh, with going on, but hey, this might be a fast, cheap way to end the dispute over the frying pan or whatever. Whatever to you doesn't seem that important, but is highly emotional and valuable to them. Great, now I understand. Tony, you look like you're about to say something. I just, I had a couple of questions. The first question is, is, is there anywhere in the country or even within Florida where arbitration is used more regularly? And secondly, is it a possibility to sever off just small issues in arbitration, we, you know, where the parties just are locked heads on one item or one aspect rather than all of the issues? Sure, I think arbitration is very flexible. I mean, you could, um, it, 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 either in non-binding or binding, you could, you could self-select um, the Winnie the Pooh collection or something of that ilk, uh, or the, the collection of rare and exotic uh, insects. Uh, or maybe a business. Or maybe a business. Okay, be practical. Uh, <laughs> kidding. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's very possible to to um, to isolate one thing and take it uh, somewhere else. The only the only other case that I found um, in this arena was in um, I think it was in Connecticut. Um, I know there's an attorney in Orlando that talks about it on his website um, because I cribbed some of his stuff, but I don't. Uh, I don't uh, know if he practices or not, but hey, Lee County's been in the forefront before, so why not now? Keith, I know you're dying to say something. <laughs> um, I was simply going to answer uh, Tony's question uh, about, um, I've read some about arbitration in the past in family law and divorce cases. And there are some other states that are using it. Um, I don't remember offhand uh, where they are and there's certainly not a lot of them, but there are some. And I think it's definitely a, um, uh, another toolbox uh, type of approach. Um, and you have to decide whether arbitration or I mean, sorry, binding or non-binding arbitration uh, would be appropriate if you wanna move forward. But I think times are different now than they were you know, even 20 years ago with the court system and the options for dispute resolution. And uh, um, one of the reasons why we're not used to it is because we're coming from those times and, uh, and it's all new and we're trying new things. And so I'm, I'm all for it. And I think also, as Anne mentioned, some parties want to have a decision done that day. So they are already waiting um, sometimes for a long time to actually move on with their cases. Then they are finally in mediation and now they are being told, well, that's not the end. If you are not settle um, your issues today, then you have to wait for a court hearing, which may be one month, two months from now on. And they get frustrated and they just want to settle. So it, it might be a good idea to think about if there is the option um, to, to offer, okay, you can actually have an arbitration directly if you reach an impasse in your mediation to be done with your case really that day and don't have to wait any longer. That's a very good point. Jamie, you had a question or a comment? Sure. Um, so to, to answer, uh, I think, Tony's uh, question, I've been informed that they may be doing this up in Hillsborough County. Um, they may be doing at least non-binding arbitration for family law cases up there. So it might be something if they are, if we could find out through maybe the Hillsborough County Bar, kind of how they have that implemented. Um, I've thought about it too as well, Herb, and that's been one of my questions is what prohibits somebody from on an NBA asking for a frivolous de novo um, trial? You know, what, what prohibits that if somebody just doesn't like the decision? Uh, unlike in a civil case where you're correct, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a, a penalty, I guess, if, if the jury doesn't find within a certain uh, percentage of what the arbitration award was, you can seek fees. So, I, you know, I have that same question as well. Um, and then, of course, I have the question of, you know, how do we implement this 
And, and I, I do disagree that, you know, uh, the comment of there has to be a significant assets. I, I actually disagree. I think if what, one of the biggest issues, and, and I've had some of these cases recently in mediation where it's just a house, but they can't figure out who's getting the house, just one item. They don't have to have a million dollars in assets, but just one item. And they may be six months before they get to trial. And meantime, they're hemorrhaging money on this house on one piece of property of who's paying for who and, uh, you know, motions for, uh, you know, temporary this or that. And, you know, if we could shove those into, you know, arbitration, we could get it resolved, you know, in, in a month or two rather than in six or eight months while they're hemorrhaging money. But how do we implement that? And I guess my question is this, like for the, the civil judges that make the determination of which cases go to NBA and which cases go to mediation, uh, I guess they triage that the civil judges do, I'm assuming. Interesting point. Leslie, you had something you wanted to say? Um, this may not be, this may require a really deep answer, but <laughs> I'm looking at this from um, an evidence perspective, because since we've been on Zoom, um, you know, admitting evidence is a little bit more of a challenge and um, than it was when we used to bring the five binders into the courtroom. So um, how, how does evidence play into the, the um, arbitration process? Obviously, we don't come with all of our trial documents when we do a mediation. I've done many mediations, but not any of the arbitration. How do we, how does that work with evidence? The, the ones that I've done, are not in family law, but in civil, um, the parties present um, documents in advance, whether it's on a, on a Dropbox or some other fashion. And then if there's something that comes up on the spur of the moment, they either email uh, documents or they, uh, they put them on a share screen, but uh, share screen is not a great solution, but it's, it's, it's actually very easily handled. And, and I think the process process works really well in civil, and I think we need to tweak it for family law, of course, but I, I, I definitely think it's a good idea. I think that's probably one of the big benefits of arbitration is that the parties get to make the rules and they can make rules at evidence the way they want to, what's best for them, um, unlike a court of law. That's, a, that's an excellent point, especially with, uh, with binding arbitrations, yes. I'm sorry, Leslie, did you have something else you were going to say? No, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Well, I um, sort of see it that it's just a tool in the toolbox, like um, some of the parties on here, the tribunal system where p parties would have their day in court. Those were usually on um, family or children's issues, but, um, you know, parties still get their day to be, quote, judged by their private arbitrator, which is sometimes what your clients want. Um, so to me, I don't know that we need a complicated process. If somebody thinks, hey, I have the case and you get your colleague, I think most of, and you do a stipulation if that, if you need that, depending on which you're choosing, I, I think most judges would be inclined to say, um, you know, if, if everybody's on board to, to let you try it. So I don't know that we need a complicated process to get started if the right situation evolves, obviously, um, maybe it's something one of the, you know, I think obviously the, um, this committee, the ADR of the, of, for Lee County, at least could be working on issues and maybe together with AFLP. Good point. Very good point. Um, Alexandra, did you have anything else you wanted to say? I know you haven't said much about the arbitration side and you're an arbitrator. Yes, I know, but, uh, I really enjoy listening to other perspectives. Uh, to get to know what other people think. And hopefully we get this um, maybe running uh, down here in Lee County and Collier County, at least as another tool, as everybody is mentioning, to not directly maybe implement it, but have it somewhere in the back where um, we can say, well, so we prepared everything, we, are, we know what we should do. And then one of the judges maybe is the forerunner of saying, hey, let's just try this. I think uh, the most of us mediators, arbitrators are on board with this. And we like to assist the parties, the attorneys. And of course, we like to take the burden from the judicial branch um, if we can, because sometimes, as we both mentioned before, the parties want someone to judge about their issues 
but they know uh, if they go to trial, it's maybe six months out, as Jamie mentioned. So, and um, there are some pressing issues sometimes that cannot be answered sooner, but they want a solution for that. So I think it's really a, a good idea to think about and to um, maybe discuss this further to see if that's really an option down here in Lee County, Collier County to implement and start the process of maybe the rest of Florida will follow us. Thank you. And, and I will remind everybody that Lee County was one of three jurisdictions in the state of Florida that was chosen for the pilot program for the case management system, whether you love it or hate it. And I know there's opinions both ways. Um, still, uh, we, we have a history of being out in front of other counties, other circuits in terms of uh, creative thinking. So we're at the end of our, our time, everyone. Thank you. And I do like Judge Swift's idea of following up. Um, certainly the ADR practice section up here in Lee would be happy to spearhead something. Um, but I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, I want to thank Judge Swift especially for presenting and our other judges for attending and um, also for Alexandra for, for putting so much effort into the PowerPoint and into her presentation. And especially I want to thank Lauren Bois, who is our, our fearless leader from the bar and uh, executive director and does a great job all the time. So at this point, um, Lauren, I think we're ready to um, head out. And um, thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you, everybody. everybody.